thank you for this opportunity to speak on our COVID-19 guidelines and our reporting requirements. I know all of you have been working tirelessly uh, <laughs> on your preparations and developing your protocols um, for return to in-person learning. And I know many of you already have students on campus in some capacity. Um, so you have some experience going through these steps. Um, but thank you for the work that you have done to date and for all the work to come. And we're gonna get through it together and it's all gonna be okay. So I also know that the guidance is constantly changing and evolving and the protocols are changing as we learn more about the virus. So it's a lot to keep up on. Um, but today what we would like to do is make sure we're all on the same page with the guidance as it stands for our county. Um, and that we leave knowing what steps we need to take when there's a case in the school community or when there's an exposure and then how our um, efforts connect. And then I think Jill will just add on that further into the meeting. So just a few objectives for our time together, just being able to access our communicable disease control tools for guidance and reporting. Um, Come familiar with the communication pathway, which Jill will go into a lot more as well, um, for positive cases in the community, uh, the school community, and then identify steps to be taken when there is a case in a student or staff member, or a symptomatic student or staff matter, member, or exposures related to the school. And then talk a little bit about a suspected case of COVID-19, what we should really be worried about before testing. So just a quick overview of COVID-19 in San Mateo County. Um, these data are from our San Mateo County Health Dashboard, as well as the California Blueprint for Safer Economy. And you can see here that we are approaching about 10,000 cases since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, of course, these are only cases that have been tested, so likely that number is, is higher. Um, and then here we have our um, COVID-19 related deaths thus far. Um, and then over on the right, the, um, the age distribution of cases within the county to date. And then here, this is taken specifically from the California Blueprint, um, which places counties into a four tiered color coded system that replaced our monitoring list. Um, so it ranges from purple, which is the highest risk level down to yellow, which is the lowest. Um, and there are two variables that factor into these tiers. The first one is the number of new cases daily per 100,000. And then the second variable is the positivity rate. So the percentage of tests positive. Um, and this is over a seven day period. So purple indicates um, widespread risk and that's where we were before and as many of you know I'm sure we just recently um, were downgraded to the red tier which indicates substantial risk so moving in the right direction uh, and these are our specific San Mateo um, County numbers for from September 5th to September 12th we had 6.6 .6 cases per 100,000 um, so that puts us right kind of in the middle of that that red substantial tier. And then we had 4.5% for our um, positive test positivity rate, which is actually lower than the red tier. But as soon as you have one that falls into either of those two variables, then you land in that tier. So the highest one trumps the, the other one. So we would need to remain in this tier for two weeks for the option to resume in-person learning on a wider scale, which I'm sure you're, you're all aware of. So it's a, it's a step closer. All right, so I know many of you are familiar with our checklist format for outbreaks and our line list reporting, but this may also be a new role for some of you, particularly if you are, um, a pandemic lead that is maybe not a nurse or, or hasn't had to report to the health department before. Um, these are our key guidance tools um, that really, they're meant to guide your initial response to a case or an exposure in the school. And then once you have a case, the line list helps to monitor transmission and spread within the school. Um, and then of course, this goes along with the protocols that you've developed and that um, complements the San Mateo County Pandemic Recovery Framework, which I'm sure Jill will talk about. 
Um, and so both of these documents can be found here at this website and under it's under the schools and child care facilities section. And then also once you make contact with us, if you do have a case in your community, then we, we sort of um, customize this and email it to you as well in our secure email format. So then once we start communicating with line list reporting, then that always has to be done securely. And then for the checklist, I'm not going to go through every page, um, but I do recommend that you spend some time with it and become familiar with it. It's a really valuable resource. Uh, it has several helpful sections, including definitions. So what is a close contact? What's the definite, or, you know, difference between isolation and quarantine? Those kind of, which I, I know you are all familiar with these concepts, but if you're anything like me, you've read so many documents and then sometimes something goes out, you know, out of your brain. So it's, it's a helpful reference for that. And then there's a section on reporting requirements, which we'll talk about, and different scenarios, which I find very helpful. And then, of course, infection control measures. So I do want to highlight some key um, pieces of the checklist and go through some scenarios together. So here we have just a, a section, a snapshot from the re reporting requirements section. And the first point here is that all COVID-19 cases need to be called in immediately to the San Mateo County Disease Control Program. And then that's our main number there, the 5732346 number, which I'm sure you guys know, um, as well as any clusters of undiagnosed respiratory illnesses, which is the same as previous years, right? So anything above your baseline that you're seeing and clusters within um, classrooms or cohorts. Uh, so uh, COVID-19 cases and clusters called in immediately. That's kind of the first reporting requirement. Um, and then your school principal or designee would um, notify your district point person. Um, so the superintendent's informed and then that goes up the chain to the San Mateo County Office of Education. And then the designee would also complete the line list, which we'll talk a little bit more about in detail um, for all new cases. And then I would also add on their suspected cases and submit to us via the secure email. And right now that's our, um, the email box that's listed there is our general San Mateo County CD control inbox, but we will have a specific one dedicated to school. So I'll get that out to you as soon as it's available. Um, and the assigned investigator. So it would be either myself or someone else on our school's team um, you would email it to that particular investigator and the main email box. And then we will be in contact daily, whether by phone, by email, we'll kind of figure out what's best and what's needed. And then the next point on there is submitting a map or floor plan if you haven't already. I know we have some um, that just kind of helps us uh, get an idea of the school environment. And then the last two points are hopefully things that um, are already in the works for you guys, but implement an internal communication plan for students, families, and staff. So a way for them to report if they do have symptoms. Um, I imagine everyone's planning a health screening questionnaire. That's one way to report, right? Um, and then designate a staff liaison to be responsible for responding to COVID-19 concerns. Um, and so especially so that other staff should know who sh they should go to. Um, and who they can, how they can contact that person. And then that person will be trained to coordinate the documentation and tracking of possible exposures, and then the notification pieces. So one thing I should mention, just going back to that first point, you don't need to call us at the San Mateo uh, CD Control Program for um, symptomatic students for students who failed their health screen. You don't need to call those in. Of course, if you have a question about something, that's that's totally fine, um, but it's not a required reporting. Um, and you don't need to call us for ill students that are sent home. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about some steps that you would take in those scenarios, um, unless you are starting to notice a cluster. So it's really just the confirmed cases or the clusters that you would call for reporting purposes. Also, you don't need to call for a um, positive case in a family member either. So that student will need to be quarantined and we'll talk about that, but you don't need to call to report the family member. Unless, of course, there's a question or concern and we can talk about that. All right, so this is another snapshot from the checklist. 
from the scenario section. And so the first column here is the situation, right? Whatever scenario it may be. Um, and the second column is the action steps the school would take. And the third column is the communication steps the school would take. So in this scenario, if it's a student or staff member that tests positive, first thing you're gonna do is um, notify San Mateo CD control, okay? And then kind of parallel, you're gonna go up your own communication pathway within the school and the district and so on. Um, the case, the confirmed case should be isolated and excluded from school for at least 10 days after symptom onset or date of positive test if case is asymptomatic. And that recommendation is really based on what we know about the infectious period for COVID-19. So when we think about when someone's infectious, we look at the two days before their symptom onset up until typically 10 days after their symptom onset. If they are asymptomatic, then we um, go by the test collection date, not when they learned of their result, not when they reported the result to you, when the test was actually, you know, the swab was, day the swab was put in their nose. And so then you look at the two days prior up until the 10 days after, and you consider that their infectious period. So when you're thinking about exposures in your school, you're thinking about two days prior to the date symptoms started, as well as afterwards, if they did happen to come to school after. And then the next item here is uh, you would quarantine and exclude the affected cohort or pod for 14 days after the last day the case was present at school while infectious. So again, it's not 14 days from when you're notified, it's 14 days from when the student was actually there while infectious. And then if there's questions about that, if sometimes it can get tricky to determine the timeline, then that's something that we can talk through um, when we initially connect. Um, both those points being said, what often ends up happening is the case comes back at the same time as their cohort, right? Because the case can actually come back a little bit earlier because that's based on their infectious period being over, but you're not going to put them in a new cohort because then that messes up all your cohorts. So really everyone's probably coming back at 14 days. Um, and then the 14 days is based on the incubation period. And that's why it's different from the case um, time frame. So potentially after someone is exposed to COVID, um, they have a chance of developing symptoms up until the 14th day, um, which is why they're quarantined, right? So um, testing of contacts can be considered and is recommended, um, especially for symptomatic contacts, um, but a negative test will not shorten um, the quarantine. And you'll hear me say this a couple times, I think I even bolded it somewhere in here, um, that you can't test out of quarantine. So it's wonderful, it's great if on day seven of your, after your exposure you're negative, it's, it's very reassuring, but it doesn't speak to whether you're gonna be negative on day nine or on day 10. So it really is important, you know, and I know parents, um, they want their kids in school, many of them. And so they, they may put, well, look, he got tested. I had a parent the other day who tested their kid three times, but it's still, they still can't come back until it's been 14 days. But again, it's of course really reassuring when it's negative. Uh, and then thorough cleaning and disinfecting of the classroom and primary spaces where the case was spent. And then a key point here, the other pods can continue in-person instruction. The entire school does not need to close. They carry on as normal. And then moving over to this column, notification to the affected um, cohort or pod. So we will provide you with a, um, a quarantine template, a, a letter that you can put on your letterhead and send out to, um, to the families of the, the pod and to any other staff members in that same pod. Of course, the initial contact I meant would be by phone call and then um, and then send out this letter along with any other communication that you as a school feel like you need to send out. But this is just the specific um, quarantine, quarantine recommendations. Okay, so let's take a look at a case study showing how this might unfold. Um, so it's Monday morning, you receive a phone call from a parent that their child, Henry Smith, tested positive for COVID-19 over the weekend and won't be attending school today. Henry's in fourth grade and is a student in cohort 12. Um, in this scenario, and in my ideal scenario, Henry's only in one cohort. He doesn't go to any other cohorts. They stay together. Um, 
Henry has a sister in second grade in your school and is in cohort four. What do you do? All right. So the first step, you're going to collect pertinent information from Harry's, Henry's parent while you have the parent on the phone. So is Henry symptomatic, right? Why did he get tested? Like, is he tested because he was exposed to somebody or is he symptomatic? Um, if so, when did his symptoms start? Because that's going to help us determine when his infectious period is and which symptoms, okay? And this is all, all this information that you gather, you're gonna put on the line list. When was his test collected? And that's particularly important when, he, when someone's asymptomatic and what type of test was performed. So the reason why I bring that up is that we want to make sure that it's a PCR test or your molecular test or you know, a rapid antigen test is fine too um, that is being used to diagnose um, and that it's a test that's diagnostic. So anything up the nose, throat, saliva, that's all good. What we don't want and what is not confirmatory is, and what we can't make decisions off of is um, serology testing, so it's blood testing. So we just wanna make sure, particularly if it was someone was exposed, sometimes they will end up getting a blood test and that doesn't, um, that doesn't help us much at this point. It's, you know, it's checking for antibodies. It doesn't give us a good sense of acute infection, whether someone's infectious or not, um, whether it was a past infection or ongoing infection. So really our decision-making is based on a molecular test, so a PCR or the, there's some similar other types, um, or a rapid antigen test. All right, so where was he tested? Sometimes that's helpful for us. Like if we, for some reason, don't get the lab result, it's supposed to be automatically reported to us, but um, sometimes you know there's glitches and so we can hunt it down. Um, can he think of any close contacts at school really outside of his cohort in the two days prior to his symptom onset for when he was at school last? Um, this, you know, when you're on the phone with the parent and hopefully, you know, the parent and Henry can kind of think through, was there, like, did you sit after school with Joe for more than 15 minutes within six feet of each other? Any, any type, ideally these things are not happening and it's not going to be an issue, but you just never know. Um, so that's always helpful to know. Has he had any known exposures to anyone COVID-19 positive? That's helpful to know. Um, and does he have any siblings at the school or other schools? All right, moving on. There's a lot of steps to this one. Okay, so you're going to inform the parent that Henry will need to remain out of school until he reaches criteria for discontinuation of isolation, which is the 10 days that we were talking about before. But just in more detail, it's um, 10 days from symptom onset. He also needs to be fever free for 72 hours. Um, so for three days, and those three days can be the last of the 10 days. That's fine. Um, but sometimes it does rarely, but sometimes it does extend it. So if someone's still febrile on the ninth day, they still got to go, they, we still need the three days. So they're really not going to be cleared for, for three more days. Um, and then, so 72 hours without fever reducing medications, and then an overall improvement in symptoms, right? Heading in the right direction. So if he's asymptomatic, it's going to be 10 days from the collection date. Um, and then we're going to tell Henry that, unfortunately, or Henry's parent, that the sister in second grade also needs to remain home in quarantine 14 days from her last exposure to Henry while he's considered infectious. So this can get a little tricky when you have a household member who's positive. Um, what needs to happen, and so there's two ways that this can happen. If Henry can be truly isolated within his house, which is hard for kids, right? So own room, own bathroom, food is being left outside of Henry's door. There is no contact. You don't see each other for these 10 days. Then we consider, can consider that truly isolated. And the 14 days for the sister can start on the date that that started. But it's in households, especially with children, that is very rarely the case. It's hard to do. So more often than not, that sister's 14 days is going to start when Henry is his last day of symptoms. Like that's when he's um, at the end of his isolation period. Sorry, not last day of symptoms, the end of his isolation period. So on Henry's 10th day is con considered his sister's last day of exposure to him. 
while he's infectious. So her 14 days starts on his 10th day most often, um, which means the sister's going to be out longer than Henry. Again, testing's recommended. It will be great. It would be great, um, but it's not going to shorten quarantine. Um, so, because you can't test out of quarantine. So, Henry's sister is going to be out for quite a while. All right. And then you're going to call CD Control and you're going to follow your school communication chain and you're going to provide all this pertinent information regarding um, from Henry's parent and how many students were in the cohort. You are going to have the cohort information and you know keep track of it. We will get it from you if we need it, but um, you don't need to report all those names to us. Um, but to have an idea of how many and, and whatnot is, is really helpful. Then you're going to notify the staff and families of Henry's cohort of the exposure while maintaining confidentiality. And I know um, everybody knows this, and, but, but I just have to say that it is so important that we maintain the confidentiality. Um, we don't share any of the information with the fa other families and other staff. There really should be at your schools kind of a need to know team, right? Um, so we, we want to keep that circle as small as possible and really try to protect patient confident or yeah, student staff confidentiality. Um, so we're going to, you know, you're going to inform them that there's been an exposure. They need to quarantine for 14 days. You're going to provide them that quarantine notice on your letterhead. Um, if in school currently, when you find out this information, the cohort members should be sent home as soon as feasible. So you're calling, you're explaining the situation, parents are arranging to come pick them up. It's going to take a little while, but it should be as, as, as soon as feasible. And then siblings and household members of the case also need to quarantine. So Henry's sister, for example, or if Henry had a parent who was a teacher at the school, that parent would also have to quarantine. Henry's sister's cohort does not need to close or quarantine. So this is a question we get a lot. So Henry's sister is the contact, right? She's the contact to the case, but her cohort, her cohort are their contacts to contacts. So contacts to contacts do not have to quarantine. All right, you're gonna close off any areas used by Henry. Um, and do, not, and do not use until thoroughly cleaned and disinfected. Idea, ideally, you can wait 24 hours until Henry was last there just to kind of let things dissipate. And then cohort members may be tested. Henry's cohort members um, is what I'm speaking about in this point, but especially important if symptomatic, but this will not shorten their quarantine period. All right, and then we're going to initiate line list reporting. Um, including any positive or suspect cases. We'll talk about that. Um, and then CD control, we will conduct a case investigation with Henry and Henry's parent. And so what that looks like is when, that, when we have a positive case in San Mateo County of COVID-19, um, they are, that person's interviewed by one of our investigators or one of our contact tracers. And we you know, give them the isolation requirement. We reinforce that. We make sure they, are, you know, we're trying to stop the chain of transmission, right? So we make sure they are isolating. They know how to isolate. They can get the resources they need. Who's going to bring them food? Do we need to connect them to, to people that can help with that? Um, and then we do contact tracing. So in Henry's case, we would talk to mom and then hopefully our dad or, you know, parent, guardian, whoever. Um, and then also Henry, as long as they give us permission. Um, and try to identify close contacts within that Henry was around during his infectious period. So the two days prior to his symptoms through the 10 days after. And if you can catch them soon enough, you're hopefully not having any close contacts in the 10 days after, right? Um, so we're gonna ask if, did you have any play dates? Did you, what did you, you know, we, we literally go through each day. What did you do? Do you remember, you know, did anybody come over? Did they, so if we identify, let's say, he um, went over to Joe's house on the day before, like after school, and played video games for a little bit. They were closer than six feet. It was a couple of hours. Then we're going to get that contact information from Henry's parent. We're going to contact Joe and Joe's parent, and we're going to quarantine Joe. 
and Joe may be in a different pod, right? So let's say for this example, Joe's in a different pod. Joe's pod doesn't need to quarantine, but we're gonna quarantine Joe. He's gonna be out of, you know, out of commission for 14 days. All right, so the line list. Um, I know this can be a little intimidating looking and a little overwhelming, but it really is pretty easy. Um, once a case has been identified, we need to initiate the daily reporting, and this is the tool that we use for that. Um, you're gonna add the first case here on the first line where it says line 15, and it's really, you're gonna go straight across and just answer all the questions that you can. You may not know all the answers, but to the, with the information that you have. So reporting date, that's gonna be the date that you called us. Um, so let's say for example, today, 924, the name of Henry Smith, his date of birth, gender, student or staff, pod number or classroom number, however you're identifying your cohorts, that's especially important. And then illness onset date, any of this information you've been able to get from the parent. And then there's a whole list of symptoms. It was hard to fit this whole spreadsheet on, on the screen, so it keeps going off the screen. Um, and then there's a place to put, you know, what type of test, if you happen to get that information. There's a comment section that you could put any other exposures that you know about. Um, and then there's a place for parent information. And so this has to be submitted every day. Let me just close that. Okay, and ideally what it looks like, right? This is, this is what I like to see is, so it's gonna be 924, all of Henry's information, and then it's gonna be 925, and you're gonna write right next to it, no new cases. And then you're gonna email it to me. And then it's gonna say the next, and you're just gonna continue adding to that list. It's gonna be 926, no new cases. 927, no new cases. And so even if there's no activity, which is what we hope to see, you still have to send it in. And then once we've reached 14 days um, from Henry's onset, then we can discontinue. As long as we've had no new cases, we can discontinue line list reporting. And then the other thing you will add on here is um, any suspect COVID cases. And this is once you already have a case in the community, our bar is lowered and we're, we're trying to identify any possible other cases. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. So this is in the checklist. This is um, just a little snapshot from it. Um, and this is what we would consider a suspect case. So in the absence of a more likely diagnosis, okay, so for example, in the absence of like, they had a positive flu test or something, that's that's helpful, but um, at least one of the following. So fever and cough, fever and shortness of breath, new loss of taste or smell. That's a pretty um, key indicator for COVID. Um, so you just have to have, if you have that one symptom, we would be highly suspicious. Um, painful purple or red lesions on the feet or swelling of the toes, which you may have heard that referred to as COVID toes. Pneumonia on clinical exam or um, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So the other option would be if they don't have one of those, at least two of the following. So you can see this is a huge list of symptoms <laughs> and it's going to catch a lot of things. Um, and it, it's, we're going to figure out, we're going to wade our way through it. We're going to figure it out. But, you know, two of these more common symptoms here in conjunction. Um, one thing to keep in mind with children is that they don't, uh, they still present with fever and cough, but just not as, as often as adults. So I think a recent report came out um, looking at like 260 or so children and 50% um, of them reported fever and cough as their most common sim symptom versus adults, 70% reported those as their most common symptoms. So, and then I think one third of the children reported more of the GI symptoms, diarrhea, vomiting, stomach pain. So there's really a wide range and we just have to, we have to keep in mind that children, it, as with other illnesses, they don't always present typically. So anyone who meets this criteria ideally would go on your line list. Okay, another scenario. It's Tuesday morning, it's a really bad week. And one of your teachers, Flora Jones, calls out with a fever and headache. What do you do? Okay, 
So you're gonna gather information regarding Flora's symptoms and onset. Did she work during the two days prior to symptoms? So you're mentally preparing yourself, right? You're not doing anything yet, but you're like, oh, okay. Um, Cause you wanna be able to kind of move quickly into action if that's the, if she does actually have um, COVID. You're looking at Flora's cohort and possible other exposures. Um, and again, I say per flora and per records because we want to protect, you know, protect confidentiality. We don't want to go, every, hey, did you spend time with flora? Did you spend time with, and I know nobody would do that, but just to, just as a reminder. So it's, you know, hopefully she teaches one cohort. Um, but was there a, you know, when we get to that point, was there an in-person staff meeting? Was there other, other things that you can think of that she may have been involved in in those two days. And then encourage Flora to seek evaluation and recommend testing. Flo and during this time, Flora's cohort remains open while awaiting more information. So her test comes back positive. Um, her symptoms started Monday evening. Remember she called on Tuesday, her symptoms started the night before. Um, you have determined she worked on Monday. Okay, so what we're worried about, we're, we're worried about Monday, Sunday, and then I even worry about Saturday. I just automatically do the two full days. But you don't have to worry about Saturday and Sunday. I have to worry about Saturday and Sunday. But um, you guys are focused on Monday. And then she only taught cohort five, which is fabulous. Um, she does not report any close contacts at school. Now what? All right. So you're going to give Flora the same spiel. She has to be out for 10 days, fever-free for 72 hours with no fever-reducing medications or um, an improvement in symptoms. You're going to notify us in your district contact. You're going to notify the staff and families of Flora's cohort. Uh, while maintaining confidentiality, you're going to send the quarantine letter. Okay, and if in school, they're going to be sent home as soon as feasible. You're gonna close off areas, same thing, clean and disinfect thoroughly. And again, cohort members may be tested, especially if they're symptomatic, it's important, but this will not shorten the quarantine period. Okay. Oh, another one. Oh, and then we're gonna do line list reporting. And then we will do our case investigation with Flora, like we did with Henry, and try to dig up anything else. All right, and then I'm not, I'm just gonna briefly highlight these two because I know we're, we're getting close to time, but um, so this one comes up a lot as well. A family member of a student or staff member or another close contact comes up positive. So let's say for example, it's um, Sarah and Sarah's mom tests positive, okay? But Sarah's mom doesn't work at the school, she works somewhere else, um, what are we gonna do? So this is, these are your steps here. Um, you're going to send Sarah home. Um, hopefully she wasn't fit in the first place, but you're going to send Sarah home um, because she's a contact, right? She's a contact to her mom. Um, she should be quarantined for 14 days from the last exposure to the case. Again, this is going to get sticky because Sarah probably cannot quarantine away from mom. Unless one thing we do with the county when we do our um, case investigations is when someone can't successfully isolate in their home, we offer them alternative housing. So if we are able to pluck Sarah's mom out of the house, right, and um, another adult is there to take care of the family, then Sarah's 14 days would start on that date that mom goes to the hotel or goes to the alternative housing place. If not, and if there's still some level of contact, which there probably will be when it's a parent and a child, Sarah's 14 days is going to start at the end of mom's 10 days. Um, so she's probably, she's going to be out probably more like 24 days or somewhere around there, depending on when mom started getting sick. Um, testing can be considered, but will not shorten the 14 day quarantine. Can't test out of quarantine. And then Sarah's classroom remains open. Her pod remains open because they are contacts to a contact. They don't need to quarantine. And then, um, we, we do not recommend sending out, um, we don't have a recommendation to send out exposure notices. Um, in that type of scenario, I know some schools do have that in their communication plans and, you know, you should follow what you have um, set up. I think you can make arguments either way. It could raise panic, but then also there's, there's panic from lack of information too. So 
um, but we don't have a formal re recommendation that you would need to make a, a notification in that point, at that point. Next one, this is also taken from the checklist, also a little tricky. So a student or staff, let's say, they screen positive on one of your health questionnaire screening, right? Hopefully they don't make it into school. Um, or let's say they're at school and they develop a sore throat and a fever. You're gonna isolate them immediately and wherever you plan to isolate, you're gonna send them home. You're gonna recommend testing. Um, and then you follow the path for if they're positive or you follow the path for if they're negative, which is also laid out in the checklist, what to do in those instances. It is sometimes tricky um, if they are not able to get tested. Um, and that could be if the parent doesn't want them to be tested. It could be the provider had a low index of suspicion. Um, it could be for a number of reasons, but really if, if they meet that suspected definition, right? The two of those symptoms listed in the top box, or sorry, the one of those um, symptom clusters in the top box or two in the bottom box, they really should be tested before they return to school. Um, so then the options there, if they won't get tested um, and we can't figure out how to make it happen, um, then they're gonna, you would just have them stay out for 10 days and presume we're just gonna treat them as if they were positive just in case. But the school and classroom remains open. Um, all right. So just on a last note, that is our officer of the day line, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. They will connect you with someone on the school team. Um, we're trying to make sure the guidance that we give is consistent and that we can get a quick response. Because um, as you can imagine, as we go into fall, there's going to be outbreaks in assisted living and skilled nursing and schools. And so we're trying to really focus our efforts to make sure we can um, get to people promptly. Um, and then that phone number I just want to emphasize is only really for you guys. Um, it's not to be given out to parents. It's not to, um, it's not for the public. It's, um, it's a resource for school nurses, district, um, the um, pandemic leads. So just to keep that in mind. And then that's our email box. And again, there will be a, a more dedicated school, COVID schools email coming shortly. Okay. I think that's, that's my, those are my main points, Jill. So I'm, I'm happy to take questions or I, I don't know how you wanna handle that piece. I see there are questions in the chat box. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if, if you want me to go through these. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so let's start with, um, one of the things I saw was, um, When should we exclude children and staff with possible symptoms and for how long? For example, if a child has a headache and nausea, are they presumed positive unless they get tested? If they are negative and never exposed, when can they come back? Yeah, yeah. So let's, so that is, that is this scenario, right, <laughs> right here. Um, so if they have, let me go back to that suspected list. Sorry, I'll try not to make you dizzy. Hang on. There we go. Okay, what were the examples? Like, was it headache and? It was headache and nausea. Headache and nausea, okay. Which, which could be so many things. Um, so if you look down here, so it, it, that falls into at least two of the following cr criteria, the headache and the nausea. So we really, so they need to be excluded and then we really want them to get tested. Um, if they test negative, then they can come back, let me see. Let me get to that point, hang on. I'm gonna to try to share the, can you guys see that okay? Okay, all right. Can you see the checklist? Yeah, okay. So these are steps to take in response to negative test results. And there's all kinds of variations in here. So. Um, it would be this one, a symptomatic student. Oh, no, no, that's what there's that household contact. Um, okay, a symptomatic student or staff member tests negative for COVID-19 without close contact to a known case. They can return to school in 72 hours after resolution of their symptoms. So that's without being a close contact. If they're a close contact, that's great they tested negative, but they have to quarantine for 14 days.
I'm back. <laughs> I got kicked off. Thank you for caring, Jeannie. Yeah, yeah, no. Monica's helping. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. I was just going, I was just reading through some of the questions that people had. And is there a distinction between resolution of symptoms and improvement of symptoms? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. So, I mean, resolution of symptoms, I think of as, um, you know, they're completely resolved. We, um, to discontinue isolation, um, we define recovery um, as three days fever free and improvement in symptoms, plus the, you know, the 10 days. So some people after any type of virus may have a residual cough for a while, like a post viral cough. Um, and that's fine. That's and as long as it is getting better, right? Where I hesitate to clear someone is if they're still extremely short of breath and just, you know, on day, day 10, they're still, you know, can't really speak a full sentence, then I, then I say, well, you know, let's give it a few more days before we say you're really off of isolation, just because this isn't a, seem like a significant enough improvement. I mean, it's a little bit, it's definitely subjective. Or sometimes I'll have individuals who, um, they say, oh yeah, no, I've been fever free for 72 hours. I'm like, oh, are you taking any medications? Well, I've just had a like horrible headache and body ache still. So I've been taking ibuprofen, but not for a fever. But that doesn't matter. I mean, you, you're taking something that's the, uh, you know, fever, it's going to suppress your fever. And if they're really so sick that they're still needing to take ibuprofen around the clock for body aches and headache, then I don't consider that an improvement in symptoms yet. Jeannie, there was a question about, um, you know, requiring um, proof to go back to school. And I wonder, do you actually, I don't know if you answered this while I was struggling to get back online, but do you actually provide a check off to them? Like you're saying, are you going to tell that person that they're okay? Or where's that coming from? Right. So we, um, we don't typically provide clearance letters unless it's, you know, asked for and needed just because of the volume. It's Right. It just, it's hard to keep up. Um, right. We give them clear instructions on um, when they can discontinue. Um, as we've we've beefed up a lot more of our staffing, we may get to the point where we can provide more, you know, solid check-ins at the end. Um, but right now, we've just been really trying to reach out to everyone and say, "Stay home, stay home, stay home, <laughs> stay home." Um, right. And, and I think the guidance says. Uh, doesn't really specify that you have to, as a school, I think that's a really individual process, how yeah. you're going to handle getting kid, getting people back. Yeah. And so that, that's something within your own systems where how you're keeping track and monitoring and, you know, that's like an internal systems thing. Right, right. And so it's going to involve communication with the parents on how the, the student's doing and, and if they meet that, you know, discontinue of isolation um, criteria. We can all, you know, if there is a complex situation or, you know, we can always help um, tease things out too, so. So here's a question about requiring, oops, I lost it. Requiring test results from teachers and employees. Do you have any guidance on this? Can nurses require it for public health reasons? I guess, um, you know, I think, Jeannie, correct me if I'm wrong, but anybody who gets tested, you're going to have a copy of that testing. You're going to get it, right? Yes, if they're a San Mateo County resident. Right. Yeah. So it's not like we have to just take people's word for it. Once they're reported to you, you're going to go looking for that test, right? Yes, yes. So, I mean, I guess- like If someone's answer, positive, you mean? Right. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Or I guess if it's negative, um, I don't know, maybe that's the question. Like how yeah. do we know if somebody really got tested? I don't know. Can, can school nurses require that staff show negative tests? Is that, do you think that's the question? I'm not sure. Do you want That was my question. Yeah, that is the question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I. I don't know that I can speak to that. That may be more of a kind of a policy internal 
discussion with you know the district and with county office of education and or within your own hr yeah yeah i know that there are you know we have skilled nursing facilities that require their employees to get tested and they they facilitate the testing and they know the re results and um but I think it would be an HR policy type decision. Right, and those are, those are things that are done in conjunction with labor groups. So yes. I think that's why that becomes an issue for HR. Uh, Jeannie, will these slides be available? Yes, yes. I, uh, Jill, I'll send you a new copy. I made a couple tweaks to it, so. Okay, great. And I have a shared folder that I'm going to talk about later in the great. presentation where I, I can put that. Okay. So do you all have any other questions for Jeannie? I'm sure we'll miss her if she leaves because she'll be the one to answer a lot of questions that come up. <laughs> but um, here's one. Let's see. Uh, are you reading the chat, Jeannie? I'm not. I should. Okay. Let me find it. We don't use Zoom at the county, so I'm oh, okay. Okay. clumsy. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one I see, Jill. Can we, okay. re can we request a special ed student who can't keep their mask on to be tested as frequently as the test requirement is teaching staff? Well, Require, I think that that's the kind of key word. I think everybody can make their own policies. So if, I think that the rule is you can always be more strict than the public health guidance. So um, if you make a more strict rule, that is up to the individual, you know, uh, district or, or, or um, leadership team to decide how they want to handle that. Do you have something to say, Jeannie, about that? No, I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. I was just looking at the chat. Okay. Um, looks like there's a couple other ones in there. Um, if the person is symptomatic with other symptoms besides a fever and has been fever-free for 72 hours, does the 10 day period start 72 hours after the person has been fever free or 10 days after the last? Hmm. So the 10 days starts at the first symptom when they first become sick. Um, and then the 72 hours is in addition to that. So they need to meet three things. This is how I think of it. Um, it has to be, they have to be 10 days out from when their symptoms started. They have to have three days fever free, which can be the last three of the 10. Um, and they have to overall be improving heading in the right direction. And then again, more, you know, more often than not, your kids are probably going to be coming back more like 14 days because they're going to come back with their cohort, right? Typically, you're not going to put them in a new cohort. So then you have even more of a buffer, which is a little nice. So, Raya, I think you're the, um, are we recording this um, presentation? It looks like we are. Oh, I'm glad I didn't know that. That's good. Yeah, I'm recording. Um, Looking up here on the top. Is that true, Raya? Yeah, I'm recording. Um, okay, so I, the there. answer is that we are going to figure out what to, how we can make the recording available. I think one thing I know about Zoom is that it records every every single thing and it's sort of hard to edit things out. So I, I have I heard this recently from IT uh, little presentation that I went to. So yes, it is recorded and probably it will be available. I'm not sure how useful how you can edit it out, but it will be there. Um, a couple questions about who's submitting the line list. I don't know if that's on a district by district basis, but they're asking if the school is responsible for the line list or the district. Um, I think I think there's been a little bit of a change in the in the pathway, right? 
I think the most updated version of um, the recovery framework says that there's going to be a school liaison at each school. And then I, so I would envision that person sending the line list, but I, I think, what do you think, Joy? You know, any, however, some districts are small and they may have one district person who does it. Well, here's what I, so there were some questions about the line list and what I said, I hope this was true, is that if somebody needs to do a line list, you're going to send it to them and prompt them, even though you can find it elsewhere. You're not going to just say, okay, so start a line list. That's number one. Is that true, Jean? That's true. Yep. Okay. So once the line list gets sent to the point person who made the call, that person is your pandemic lead, right? So that should be the person who maintains the line list. I mean, classically, school nurses have been the people who have done the line lists um, for other communicable diseases. And hopefully, and I know it's true, many school nurses are the pandemic leads uh, for their schools. And I think that's a really smart idea because we already know how to do line lists. It's something that we're good at. We, we have been doing this for forever. So if it's not the school nurse or you don't have a school nurse, then whoever your pandemic lead person is will be that will be the person who contacts that number, talks to Jeannie or somebody on her team, and will get a prompt with a secure email with the line list. And so it, you don't have to go figure it out. They're gonna let you know, you gotta do it, here it is, right? And then someone asked if the um, same line list is used for the whole school year. No, it is only used for ideally for, for 14 days, right? Which is the incubation period of COVID. So you may, depending how this year goes, you may have several, you know, different line list reporting periods. Um, but basically if there's a case on September 24th, then we're gonna do it for the next 14 days and hopefully see no new cases. And so we're convinced that there's no ongoing transmission in the school. Um, but then in December, you might have another one pop up and then we start again. So it's, it's a new line list each time. So I, I see that there may be some, um, some guidelines through CDPH about recommendations for providing negative tests. And I don't really have a moment to, to dig into that now, but what I do recommend is that you talk to your administrator, your, if you're the pandemic lead or, you, or you're the administrator, you know, you just need to know what your policy is on that and see, uh, there is some, I guess there is some guidance, maybe even from the superintendent's office about um, that there may be a good idea, but I don't want to say that right off because I'm not reading the detail of it. So check in or check back with me. We have a lot of communications. Or if you're the superintendent, if you're on this meeting, you can check at your next superintendent's meeting to discuss with me and see. Jill, I can also go through um, and just jot down any questions we haven't um, gotten to yet and then email the responses if that would be helpful. Okay, that sounds great because I do have a, I do have um, some other things to work on and then to talk about and then also we have a tool for submitting other questions as well that come up so um, or I can send you a copy of the chat at the end Jeannie. Sure. Or, yeah. 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 Does anyone have any other burning questions for Jeannie? I don't I know, you know, it's hard to get, it's, it's so wonderful to have you here. And so, and you uh, are able to answer their questions so much better probably than I can. So I just wanna make sure that if anyone has another burning question for the school lead, <laughs> please ask it now. The student is asymptomatic contact. How soon after beginning quarantine is it recommended that we require testing if we're going to do so? Um, so if you are going to require testing, um, I, you know, there's different studies that, that say, you know, point pinpoint different times. Um, I know there's a neighboring county that recommends that seven days after exposure. Um, you know, the, major, 
the average number of people would develop symptoms of COVID within that first week. Um, that's the most common time. Um, so if you get a negative at day seven, that's very reassuring, right? Um, but then there's also the argument that you may want to um, test them towards the end of their 14 day period. I mean, what I wish we could do is I wish we could test them just through, you know, but because then if you're testing them at the end of their 14 days, then you know you're not letting someone back in that might be asymptomatic, but um, there's a lot of, lot of things to factor into. But I, you know, I, I would say a week is a, is a reasonable time frame after the exposure. Good question. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, these charts, if you look back, can you put your, um, the, the email, that's the link where your charts are again in the chat. Yeah. Could you put that in the chat? Oh, yep, I can do that. Are really available on the San Mateo County website. And um, I sent it out to the listserv too today. Okay. Oh, that's right. You did. But there are people maybe outside of that list. Yeah. Yep. So, um, and it's a good, it's a well-organized, um, site in general if you want to just kind of try and find the most current um, guidance it's easy to find there as well the san mateo county covid website uh public health website yeah so okay so that's that's the place to get that and um yeah that's the the website and then if you go in there you'll see the the checklist guidance and um, all of almost everything in this presentation was in there mm -hmm. side of some of the overarching things about Sam about um, San Mateo County being in the red tier. That's more of a, a California website, government website, not the public health. Okay, so Jeannie. Thank you. I hope I don't have to talk to you too much. <laughs> I know. It's always nice, but let's, let's hope it's not too, too frequent. <laughs> okay. And I look forward to uh, meeting with you again. I know we're going to talk about maybe the frequency of our meetings could be a little more frequent this year. So maybe we could get some little updates from you that might help alleviate some of the stress on your staff if the nurse, school nurses are helping guide their teams with the, um, you know, some of the burning questions, answers to burning questions and things like that. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.